Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Hassan, you know, for putting such a nice session. It's always a pleasure to be here at the ACI talking to the community about the work that we are doing on UHPC. So I'm presenting today on behalf of my PhD student, Alan Romero. He's very busy testing these columns. <laughs> so just, you know, like a disclaimer before we start, don't get super excited. There is no test results yet. The testing is happening in the next week or two. But I will uh, walk you through the process, what we have been doing, the construction that we did for these columns, why we were uh, motivated to do, you know, like recycled fibers and so on. So let me, you know, like uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Nevada, and I'm currently a visiting professor at the New York University, Abu Dhabi. So uh, I'm here you know, representing the work that we have been doing at UNR for the last few years, and you will see a lot of us today. So next, following this presentation, we have another one that Milena will give, and later in the afternoon, actually, not the afternoon, it's the second session, is right after this, right? So many of these great questions that we have been hearing, Hopefully, I can provide some answers to some of them in the presentation, like in the second part. So I'll have another one in a couple hours about the design and detailing of Excel UHPC columns. So hopefully, we can touch on some of these questions that you guys have had so, uh, so far. So I would like to start by acknowledging, you know, like the, uh, uh, our collaborator for this project. We have been doing a lot of work with industry, pretty much all UHPC vendors around the uh, country here. You know, for this specific one, we have been working with precasters as well. So I'd like to acknowledge the support we got from Jensen Precast. Confab, Kurtov, they provided the HPC, but you will see in the later you know, like presentations we have done way more than just you know, like one type of HPC. So I always like to you know, like keep an eye how the HPC market is growing, and if you go to any of these you know, like market search companies, when they look at the HPC market in general, how does you know, like it's growing, you keep seeing just very more, um, you know, like very promising number, and just these numbers keep growing more and more. So as of one of these recent like market surveys, it shows that, you know, like it's expected maybe within the next five to ten years that we have more than a billion dollar market, you know, like for UHPC. So definitely the interest is there. The applications, you can look at the number of projects that are incorporating UHPC now. They just keep increasing more and more. So with this growing market, you know, like it is about time to think of larger applications as usual. And precast is one, you know, like great area where we can really take UHPC to the next level. So larger applications in general or structural applications are in the rise. We have seen a lot in Malaysia, for example, they have full bridges now with full, you know, like girders and so on. So here in the US, we started looking at, you know, like full structural components as well. We have seen some of the recent work by the PCI, the Precast Institute, they have done like a big initiative to push or promote like Precast UHPC girders. The Federal Highway, Ben Gribiel and his team have been working on some girders as well. So there is, you know, like definitely an interest and Precast applications will just, you know, like be a nice way to take this for, for scaling. Speaking of scalability, I, I mean, as of now, is UHPC used for Precast application? Absolutely, but it is only used for the joints. So if you look at most of the connections that we have here, all the ABC applications, the accelerated bridge construction applications, you have regular concrete or conventional concrete precast components. Here you see the columns, the uh, girder here, and UHPC is used currently for the connection or for the joint. So the next step is hopefully to scale things up and use full structural components. So as I said, the UHPC can be ideal for larger structural application and the market is just helping, you know, like this is the right time to pick and leverage this growth and interest. However, there are some challenges and limitations still. So no matter with all these efforts that's happening, the cost we see some, you know, like uh, uh, the cost is coming down a little bit for UHPC, but still the cost, you know, like is an issue. So when at least you have precast or like um, production scale, you know, like uh, many, uh, production scale would at least, you know, drop the cost down a little bit. That's most of the vendors are currently doing. So pretty much all the commercial UHPCs that we see around are being now produced in ready mix trucks and ready to produce, you know, like massive amount of HPC. So these things, if not immediately imp impacting the material cost, it would at least affect some of the, you know, like production cost, labor cost, and something like that. So construction and material go together. So we want to see what would be, you know, like even more work that we can do to drive the cost in general down. There are limited studies as of now and codes on how to do the structural design. The ASH2 guidelines, for those of you who are aware of this, have already, uh, like, you know, been completed and it's out there. And the ACI committee here, we are working very hard to get maybe a design guide also in the next couple of years or so. So there are some, you know, design guidelines that are being developed, but we don't have something complete yet. And another thing also that we see as an issue is the scalability for the sustainable material. We have seen tons of versions of green 
UHPC and green, you know, the concretes, at the nice material scale. In labs, you can do a lot of great work, but are we ready to scale these things up? So these are some of the issues, and we try to address some of them. So what we are doing, you know, like the new initiative or not new initiative, we are working, you know, with, again, just one of the producers, you know, um, uh, and see what we can do. So you have the proprietary component, which will be the maybe the magical mix, let's make it this way, that makes it UHPC, UHPC. But any UHPC will have the same sand, cement, admixtures. These are the components. So if we can you know, like locally source these, you can save on the transportation, you can save on the um, in transporting the material across the country, for example. There will be a lot of benefits. But the more important thing that we are looking at here when we say economical UHPC is our you know, like efforts to explore what we can do about the fibers. Is there really, you know, like some good applications where we can use recycled tile fibers or some of these very cheap, you know, like uh, types of fibers? So that's what we are working now on and with the hope to, you know, like what we develop, what we call it economical UHPC. So sp why recycled tile fiber? This will have, you know, like a, a great environmental benefit. We have like millions of tires that go, waste tires that go to the landfills every year. They have their own environmental issues. And that's on one hand. On the other hand, steel fibers that we use in the UHPC is producing, you know, like some carbon footprint as every component, you know, like in concrete. So if we can, you know, like maybe have some benefits by using recyclable materials, it could help. Again, it's not about that we are replacing conventional fibers because for it depends on the application. There are some applications, especially when you're talking about like high quality, like tensile properties, you need good, you know, like fibers, but some applications where, and that's what that we are going to see here in this project, the seismic behavior, maybe the seismic behavior is more controlled by conventional reinforcement, the, you know, like the behavior of the structure as a whole. So maybe the component here or the tensile, you know, quality of UHPC is just needed, you know, like to some extent, but not fully. So maybe recycled fibers might work. So these are some of the things that we can always you know, like try to look at. Whatever in you know, like emerging technology, just try to match it with the right application. And that's what we are trying to do here. So our goal, as I said, you know, like is with all these developments that are being done, is to take it you know, to the next level and consider production scale mixing. So what the pictures that you see on the left, that's the very famous, you know, like green IMER mixers that everyone is using around the country for like UHPC, high shear mixers. This is, you know, like the recycled fibers. We have been doing a lot of material trials for the interest of time. Today, I'm not going to touch on any of this material work that we're doing. But this is just, you know, like on the left side, that's what people have been doing in the labs. You know, have your mixers, you have your even trials. The picture here is good to take a look at the recycled fibers. And this is also something that we are still work in progress. But if you look at this, we are using recycled fibers now as raw fibers. Well, what I mean by raw, there is no sorting, there is no, you know, like any further, like modification is doing for the size and the, you know, like uh, fabrication of the fibers itself. So we just use the raw fibers that comes out of the, you know, like uh, recycling facility. And the great news is if this ever work, this is 20 cent pound per pound. So it is, you know, like 10% of the conventional steel fiber cost. Again, I know some of the steel fiber manufacturers might not like this, but they have their great applications and we will continue to use them. That's for sure. We just need to find also what else we can do for recycled fibers. And this is one of the things that we are working on to write again, find the application for this one. So we want to take it from the left to the right. And that's what we um, uh, succeeded to do, to do mixing at a precast for these a specific, you know, like uh, economic emerging UHPCs with the recycled fibers, with the local sand and cement, and so on. So the knowledge gaps that we are trying to address here, two, you know, like uh, types or two scales of knowledge gaps at the material level, as we always start, you know, like a new development, we want to understand, you know, if recycled fiber can substitute manufactured or high-end fibers or not. So for this, we are actually doing in parallel to this project. And as we are speaking now, this is one of the ongoing work that Alan is working on. Different types of steel fiber. Even. So even for the recycled steel fibers, we got st recycled steel fibers from couple manufacturers. Some we are sorting, some without sorting. So just to get a wide range or a spectrum of how the steel fiber would affect, you know, like the uh, properties, the mixing energy and the mixer type, it might have an impact, especially when we talk recycled fibers, because you have seen this picture in the previous slide. Let me go back for a second here. Some of these will are you know like, are not really you know like easy for mixing because they have the the, the tendency to boil and to crumb in the UHPC, which is okay. But like we want to see how we you know like would go about this. 
So we want to relate this to the mixing energy and the mixer type as well, and eventually see how this affects the mechanical property. So that's one study that's going, you know, like uh, uh, right now. And in parallel to it, we want to, you know, like scale things up, as I said, and we are doing fully precast columns to with recycled fibers, with conventional fibers, and we are looking at, you know, like some of these tests that I will show um, how we are planning for them. We are focusing also on bridge columns for now. These are circular columns that you will see. So circular columns are more appropriate for bridge Construction, I'm talking about the lateral columns. Just in 10 minutes, you will see axial columns that Milana will be presenting. So it's the same, you know, like again, um, initiative, but we do several projects within the same, you know, like uh, initiative. So my focus here is on lateral or seismic columns. In 10 minutes, you'll see hopefully axial columns. So what are we doing? We, you know, like have constructed eight full precast UHPC columns and even conventional concrete time. So for the first time, we will be comparing, you know, like head to head conventional concrete column with certain reinforcement and a UHPC version of it just to see how much, you know, like uh, increase in the capacity you get. We have all different, you know, like sort of models and analytical equations out there, but we never had maybe a direct comparison, so that's maybe a valuable data, data point for future modeling and calibration and so on. So we are considering, you know, like some reinforced concrete columns as well, but we are building, we have built successfully a total of 10 columns at CONFAB, that's the, our collaborator in California. We have worked with Jensen Precast locally in uh, Sparks or the Reno area to get the footings. So you will see this picture. So we, in March and April, we were able to fabricate the columns. In August, we got all the footings fabricated as, as well. And October, just, you know, like earlier this month, we had the assembly of the columns and the footing completed. And as I said, you know, like we start setting up our first column as we are speaking. So hopefully in the next two to three months, we will go through these 10 seismic columns. So to give you an idea, what we are testing or what are the testing parameters that we are looking at, we are looking at the effective loading. Now that we are talking fibers, we know that you know concrete is not really that much of a rate dependent material, but it's always good to look at, you know, like quasi-static versus seismic loading. So one of the 10 tests that we are planning will be a dynamic shake table test. So we look at quasi-static versus seismic loading protocol. We are looking very importantly, and this is the main goal of the project, let's put it this way, manufactured fibers versus the recycled fibers that I mentioned. We are looking at different ABC connections. For those who are familiar with the ABC seismic connection, we have pocket connection, we have socket connection, we have grouted duct connection. So we are looking at two different types, the socket versus the duct connection. These are the ones that have been implemented already and show some promise for further ABC application. And we are looking even for the grouted duct material. So you know, QHPC have been used for all the joints. If we were, now we are thinking from a different perspective, you know, like the UHPC is already the optimized structural component, but do we need UHPC in the connection as well? So we are just trying even to use conventional grout in the connection and see if it would survive, you know, like the column's capacity as a UHPC column. So when you put all these parameters in mind, we came up with like a extensive, you know, like test metrics that you see here, 10 columns, again, that we'll be hopefully testing between like um, uh, the November and January of next year. So how these columns will look like, this is the schematic of the shake table test. We have a UNR, like we have a whole bunch of these blue toys that you see here. We call them shake tables. We just simulate earthquakes, you know, like with these. So we'll do one of these tests here. That's a column, a precast column, a precast footing. And these are the two different types of connections that we are considering here. The one to the left, that's what we call it, the grout duct connection. The one to the right is the socket connection. So all, every, you know, like the entire column is a full precast UHPC column, as you can see. You know, like here in the schematic, the connections are filled by UHPC, and we have a conventional reinforced concrete footing. So only for one of the columns, as I said, we will vary the material in the duct and just use conventional grout, but that's what the columns will look like. These are the typical reinforcement. So we have heard the like already about confinement on here a little bit more. So we have different spacing even. That's one of the, maybe I forgot even to list this as one of the parameters that we are varying. We are looking at different confinement levels for our columns. And this is just a typical reinforcement that you see. We are using spirals to mimic, again, typical bridge construction. And we are using maybe, I think, 1.5% steel ratio. 2% steel fiber ratio, and again, all these based on recommendation from the other ongoing work that we have done, uh, have done, and you will see it later in the next session. The footing reinforcement, that's a typical footing. Again, we try to, you know, like be conservative. We don't take chances here. We don't want the column or the test to fail unnecessarily in the footing. That's what we are not testing. So we have a decently over-designed, you know, like footing to make sure that this will be able to accommodate the connection, and the focus of the test will be on the column. 
So the construction, we did all the construction, but you know, like the next couple minutes, you know, like again, I don't have too much technical data to cover at this point. So all what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is just like, you know, go through a nice like set of pictures. So this is, you know, like the ground that what we had, the first step we did, we had the assembly of the rebar cages. We heavily instrument these so that, you know, like when we put the column later on and we test it, we'd like to get both local and global behavior. We always like to see what's the reinforcement doing and seeing inside the concrete and related to the global behavior. So these are the instrumentations that we have and all the cables have to be well secured so that when we do construction, we don't want to kill these expensive sensors inside. And we still want the data, of course, that's the more important part. So this is how we, you know, like instrumented the columns. And then this is the formwork. All the construction happened at the precast, as I mentioned. So they set like a platform so that you can pour the column from the top. And then it was like more like a, a trench style. So the column was going into the trench. So here, this is a picture from the trench, if you can see it here. I have a pointer here. So here, you know, like this is just, and we did four columns, you know, like at the time. So each batch was a two, three cubic yard. Again, that's a construction scale that we are talking about now. So we did, we were able to do four columns. And maybe one thing I forgot to mention, these are 16 inch columns. So these are pretty decent columns, you know, like it's not, and it can be used in a real bridge, by the way. So we are not really doing this as a design or a reduced scale of a current bridge. But if you have a typical bridge with a three foot, maybe, you know, like, column of this size, if you were to do it UHPC instead of UH, uh, like concrete, it can be a 16 inch column. But again, you know, 16 inch is big enough to avoid any scale issues. We don't, you know, like uh, we are at a scale here that we are not, we don't have any concerns about the steel fiber size versus the confinement size versus the column size interaction. All these are resolved when we are talking at this type of dimensions here. So. Hopefully, you know, like um, when we test, we'll see good results from this. We were pulling the concrete from the top, as I said. And the construction part, I'm just focusing on the recycled fiber here. Again, we did a whole bunch of uh, batches. One of them was dedicated for Milana's column, which you will see next. So the recycled fiber here, you know, like what we did, we put the dry components into the truck. It depends, the sand, uh, the sand and cement were, you know, like directly fed into the truck from the hopper of the uh, fabricator. The admixtures were, you know, like pumped into the truck. So there was different, you know, like things that we tried with the producer. They have their practices and we were just trying different practices. So all different sort, you know, of practices we have tried for our column. So we did pan mixer, we did truck mixing from scratch and, and so on. So we did different things there. And, you know, like what we were able to do eventually is to, you know, like construct the column. So there is a small video here. Let me show you just, you know, like to get a sense of the uh, recycled fiber. Again, these are not nice and smooth as the conventional fibers, but you see they are crumbs. So we were manually feeding them, and as you can tell even from feeding the fibers, we are not expecting a super flowable UHPC, which is okay. We need to do research. We need to know what are the challenges, what, is, what works, what doesn't work, so that we can define, you know, like what would be the next steps. So we have, as expected, some, you know, like uh, plumbing for the fibers, but when we do a flow test, but the good news is that these fibers were still, or these clumps or like, you know, boiling that happened was still, somehow we uniformly distributed across the height of the column. So we'll see when we test and we get to see the failure, how bad of an effect this might have. And this is entirely, the entire you know, like objective of this is to define again a path forward. Do we really need sorting for the steel fibers or not? If they work this way, then that's great, right? If they don't work this way or the flowability is an issue or we later on after testing find that there is a construction issue that should have been resolved, you know, like this, this is how we can define the next steps. But this is, you know, like the picture there is nothing to hide here, you know, like this is what we get and we'll see how this will work for the uh, uh, testing. These are just examples of the columns, you know, like after completing the columns, the columns were steam cured for a couple days in this trench, you just, you know, pick it up with the crane and then they strip it from the formwork and this was the picture of the completed columns. The footings happen at a different precast, these are conventional concrete columns, I mean footings, so Nothing so special about the material here, but you know, you see, as I said, these are overly reinforced just for the objective of making sure that we don't have any unintended test related failure in the footing. Both footings and like columns were delivered to our like you know, fabrication yard. That's our earthquake engineering lab. That's the fab yard outside. You see here the flatbeds with the footings and the trucks. I mean, the columns came and delivered. And this is the assembly that just happened literally three weeks ago, so, or two weeks ago. So these are very fresh pictures that I'm proud to, you know, like, and I'm glad to share with you today. And, you know, like, what will happen next? 
we are going to do, as I said, in a quasi-static test. So these columns that you have seen, the simple columns, we will test them in a quasi-static configuration. What we will do, we will take it you know, to a strong floor, we'll just apply combined axial and bending. So for the lateral load, we are just using cyclic loading here for the quasi-static. And again, we are, this are, we are just, you know, like starting a whole new area here, which is seismic behavior of UHPC columns. There is some work done here and there, but nothing, you know, like comprehensive yet. So before going and do a whole bunch of shake tables, we'd like to do, you know, like a quasi-static test just to get a quasi-static test. You can think of it assuming that there is no dynamic effects. It's like a slow motion type of the damage progression. And that is what we need to learn how the columns behave. But eventually, once we have this information, we will go and do hopefully one of these, you know, like a unique dynamic shake table test to see what the things will do. So stay tuned. We will have a lot of good testing coming up, hopefully in the next, you know, like two, three months. So maybe in New Orleans, like we'll have the chance. And you know, like I'm working with Sky Wild to see if I can get a presentation in the next ECI convention. And if so, you will see the results of this project. So thanks, and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Mohamed.